Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. On a personal note, I would like to thank Craig for convincing me to join Microsoft and, and for giving me the chance to, to implement his vision of how uh, science can be transformed by using advanced computing research technologies. And that's really been a privilege and I think we're really making some exciting progress. But uh, again, I'm grateful to Craig for letting me have the chance to do that. So Craig is joining us today uh, to provide us his perspective on the transformation in computing on which our society is embarking. So Craig, welcome. Thanks, Tony. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to talk to this group the last few years. And uh, over that period of time, a lot of the emphasis in my remarks was around the question of you know, how would computing evolve, uh, a major emphasis there was how would the user interface evolve. And I think this year was an important year for us because for the first time some of these fundamental changes are no longer research but are really showing up in very uh, important ways in our products. And I want to talk about that but I also want to talk about how I think computing will be uh, transformed a bit more broadly today. There have been uh, ongoing changes uh, many of them, of course, driven by hardware and improved uh, software capabilities. Uh, today, we, I think, are beginning to see a change from where data was uh, collected, typically for use in a single application, uh, and the realization that more and more the ability to, to compose very large data sets together dynamically really is an enabling technology. And so the, the euphemism about big data, I think, is gone from something that few people understood to, to a very uh, important part of that. The ability to compose it is important, but the ability to have a lot of it, of course, has become really, really important. Uh, and the scale with which we can collect this data is changing the way people think about it. It used to be the case that uh, whether you were an individual or an enterprise, you spent quite a bit of your time trying to figure out how to manage the amount of data that you had and accumulated. But increasingly, as storage uh, has grown exponentially at, at relatively uh, constant cost, or even declining cost, we now see the opportunity to retain data over a much longer period of time. And while that brings some additional challenges, for example, around privacy and other uh, areas of, of regulatory concern, uh, it does create opportunities if we can find a way to, to balance those interests with the insight that can be gained from this huge amount of data. I think another big change is one where uh, you know, we grew accustomed to the idea that we had computers on our desks or uh, you know, on our laps. Um, but now the, the computing is essentially much more diversified in terms of the range of clients. Tablets, phones, televisions, cars, game consoles. You know, the, there's just a very wide array of these intelligent devices. And now we don't so much think about the client-server model as, as sort of a unified architecture, which I think was very effective in the enterprise environment. We now really can think of that on steroids, where the clients, with all their diversity, uh, are coupled to the cloud uh, in a very, very integrated way. I think that that's a, a transition that's still underway, but one that will continue to be important. And of course, the thing that we spent a lot of time talking about here the last few years is the transition from the graphical user interface to the natural user interface, where computers essentially become uh, more like us. And so I think as we uh, uh, look at this uh, array of capabilities, we're really looking at an opportunity to develop uh, new applications for this information, new ways of uh, allowing people to program it, uh, to some extent, to build applications with a lot less of the traditional uh, application development complexity and yet produce things that are more helpful to people. And I think that's ultimately one of our goals, is to make the computer less of a tool and more of a helper. And I think this collection of technologies is really moving us uh, pretty rapidly in that direction. With all this big composable data, 
you know, we now have a, a big opportunity to start to learn from this data. We've known for a long time that, uh, that as we developed more and more high-scale uh, machine learning capabilities, that we'd be able to train those tools on uh, more and more different data sets uh, and, and learn things from them. And of course, you see initiatives, for example, like the one in the United States, uh, where the Obama administration created the data.gov initiative, uh, where they basically have said to all the departments of government, hey, you know, you've been collecting data for a long time. A lot of it is just sort of sequestered in your internal systems, and we want to make it an emphasis to make it available. And so whether that's for scientific purposes or demographic purposes, uh, the ability to put that data out there and allow other people to build on it for applications that the government never really envisioned, I think is just one example of how these kind of things are, are starting to take place. In order to facilitate this and, and indeed do it with a lot less of an orientation on writing programs yourself, and, but rather applying the kind of uh, techniques that people have mastered in the use of desktop tools like Excel, uh, the, one of the groups here has built uh, uh, this research toolkit that we call the Excel Datascope. And what we wanted to do was to give people the familiarity of something like Excel, where they know how to express the relationships that they're interested in, in analyzing, uh, and even the graphical tools for the visualizations. But we wanted them to be able to both apply it to much larger data sets than would conveniently fit on or be processed by their individual personal computer. Uh, and we wanted to be able to also have them compose these other public data sets. And as part of the Azure uh, effort, we have been building a sort of a data market where people who have these large, uh, even commercial data sets are being able to place them into that cloud facility on a uh, sort of a pre-staged basis and therefore make them a lot easier for people to discover and incorporate with their own proprietary data in order to solve these uh, new and interesting problems. And so in this Excel data scope environment, uh, what we did was essentially take the extensible uh, ribbon toolbar uh, that is now part of the, the current Excel product and have built a new ribbon that really is sort of a push button interface for uh, integrating and analyzing in a fairly automatic way these super scale data sets uh, in the Azure cloud. And so I think uh, by giving people these point and click kind of tools, we're able to take the the level of understanding that they had historically just about their own data and be able to transparently uh, give them access to a, a level of computational and storage capabilities and access to these composable large uh, data sets in ways that were really never possible before. Uh, in particular, this Excel data scope toolkit is built on or powered by a, uh, a technology that's been codenamed Daytona also built by uh, the same extreme computing group here, where they've gone out uh, around the company and have, have brought uh, together, particularly from the, 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 the Microsoft research organizations, a number of very sophisticated data analytic tools. And they've uh, built them in sort of a MapReduce uh, architecture, hosted it on Azure, and essentially are making it available as a service. So for all of you effective today, this uh, underlying Daytona platform is uh, available as a research toolkit, and we're going to continue to make it uh, fancier over time. And, and so the, the kind of thing that we built with the Excel data scope is something that you could build you know, yourself, either as another tool for your students or colleagues, or in fact, you could use this underlying platform uh, in a more direct way to do very specific applications. Even with that, there remain a lot of interesting challenges. Uh, the data continues to grow essentially exponentially. Uh, and, and so how to continue to refine these algorithms to deal with the scale of that data is important. Uh, the latency, even uh, essentially the latency within the, the cloud interconnects itself become a critical component in dealing with it. Many of the techniques that have been learned before in building high performance clusters, I think will find their way in some form or another into the architecture of these Azure cloud environments in order to be able to allow more uh, computational intensity uh, even in these very expanded environments. There's obviously lots of uh, challenges and, and 
uh, cost and, and time trade-offs to be made as you look at analyzing these large data sets. Uh, but we think that this is a very good beginning and one that should give the, the research community globally access to a set of tools, uh, either for direct uh, consumption or, or uh, use through things like the Excel Datascope ribbon interface that will empower people to get some of these very large data sets. You know, I've seen some uh, interesting demos of these things where you can just sit there with what appears to be an Excel spreadsheet, you know, just pull down a list of huge data sets like the recent uh, the U.S. Uh, census data and be able to point at it, select uh, a particular subset of information or automatically sample it, you know, do computations, blend it with your own data. And, and as far as you're concerned, you're just manipulating an Excel spreadsheet. But when you think about the scale of the data that is represented behind it and the fact that these an, uh, analytics are being done for you in literally a matter of seconds, you begin to realize uh, that there's really something quite magical about that. We've also been looking at applying these uh, same capabilities to develop uh, more valuable uh, capabilities in the business domain as well. One of the businesses we started here about five or six years ago is our health solutions group. And the first thing that we did in building that uh, was recognize that, that we really wanted to build a data platform. And uh, what you see here are lots of samples of data that were uh, taken uh, from the different com de departments, if you will, of a big hospital group in the Washington, D.C. area, who was our development partner over the years in, in perfecting this product called Amalga. What it does is essentially creates a, uh, a means of ingesting all of the data from all of the sources that exist within a hospital. Uh, and that's uh, the business information, the operational information, the workflow information, and the clinical and laboratory data. <coughs> and by integrating this into one very, very high-scale database and, and aggregating it over a long period of time, we have probably one of the few examples in the world where we have a, a large-scale data asset that, uh, that touches all of this sort of uh, widely varying uh, information types. So we began to ask questions, if, uh, how would we use machine learning and these very high-scale data platforms to do things that are valuable in either improving quality or lowering cost within the healthcare environment. That's a challenge that the U.S. and virtually every other country face these days, which is people want better health, and yet it's becoming ex exceedingly expensive. Uh, so one of the experiments that we've been doing is to uh, look to the data to begin to answer the questions about the readmission of people who've been in the hospital. It's one of the greatest cost drivers, certainly in the U.S. healthcare system, where you know, you're admitted to the hospital for one particular reason, uh, you know, you're treated for that, and then you're discharged. And then for reasons that people haven't really been able to understand, within somewhere between three and 30 days, a relatively high percentage of people are readmitted to the hospital, sometimes for a recurrence of what they came in for, but very frequently for something else. And uh, the question is, you know, why does that happen? Well, there have been a lot of theories, uh, some certainly correct theories, about why that would be true. But if that was the only reason, then you'd say, well, we'd fix them. They wouldn't, you wouldn't see this recurring readmission. And yet it's been obvious that we do see the readmissions. So we did a fascinating experiment, and I'll just show you a, a snippet here, uh, one example. This is sort of a, a set of data that is the output of a, uh, a tool that predicts the readmission of current patients. So what they did is we had 10 years of this data, and we basically trained the machine learning system on it and said, answer the question, you know, why did, you know, look at all the people who got readmitted out of 300,000 hospital visits, and look at all the data and see if you can find patterns that correlate with the readmission. And then based on that, develop a model that you could apply to the workflow today that would essentially attempt to predict who is in the hospital today and what the likelihood is that they will be readmitted and most importantly, why they might be readmitted. Because if you knew those things, then while you're there today, you'd fix them today. And, uh, and so uh, in, the, in the top row in this example, it shows that uh, in running this model on, on a, a day's worth of data, the, the, the topmost patient has a 38% probability of being readmitted. 
that's pretty high. Uh, and, and so uh, in the example that, that, that I'm showing you here, these were patients who were admitted for congestive heart failure. And uh, what the analysis showed that was really never, at least systematically understood by the medical community, was that if patients admitted for congestive heart failure had previously either a gastric ulcer or while they were in the hospital were being given any gastrointestinal drug, their uh, pr probability of readmission rose dramatically. Uh, and you would say, well, you know, what does their stomach have, or even, you know, historically their stomach have to do with this congestive heart failure? And it turns out, I guess, there's some interaction between the drugs that people with GI problems get treated with and the way that you're treated for congestive heart failure. But basically, the cardiologist doesn't think much about the, your stomach, and the stomach guy doesn't think much about your heart. And so if they happen to coincide, you end up back in the hospital. Another one that was fascinating was if you were diagnosed clinically as being depressed, you had a dramatically higher incidence of readmission. And that also could have been a drug-related thing, or in fact, just the, the mental state of the person and how they cope you know, in, after discharge with the, the current state of affairs. But to some extent, no one was really looking for these things. And certainly, no one had the ability to look back through all of the patient's history or other treatments are going on, and in real time correlate that in order to eliminate these problems at the point that it happened. And so by doing this, you know, we, we believe we have proven now that we can dramatically improve these outcomes. Hey, and if you're in the hospital and you don't come back, that's a better outcome. And of course, the costs associated with the second event never occur. And, uh, and so at very low marginal cost, in essence, you're not doing anything except training the old computer system on your data that you already have in order to predict this. And if you integrate it into the workflow, every morning you come in and it says, OK, today, you know, old Craig in room 204 there is, uh, is likely to be readmitted because he actually has a GI infection that's being treated too. So why don't you pay special attention to that? And I think that this kind of thing shows the power of, of doing this. Clearly here, you're integrating across a lot of sensor platforms. Uh, you know, when you think about the, the, the number of, of sensors and devices that you encounter in the hospital, but being able to monitor these things in real time is, is just really incredible. Uh, and of course, that's one of the things that, that we want to do more and more. But building predictive models uh, and being able to do these for a wider and wider array of uh, disease cases, I think, is obviously a challenge. Uh, you know, there's another list of challenges that we put on the, the screen here. These are things that you know, we can clearly see as problems yet to be solved. And so for e every step that we take in this direction, and while we can already see some potentially immediate benefits, you know, we begin to bump into a new class of research issues that uh, will either impinge on our ability to deploy these things, like the privacy and security issues, or, or where there's just a new level of semantics associated with the problem that we have to, to work on if we're really going to convert these things from research assets into deployable technologies. But they're very exciting, and it, it shows how this sort of big data environment, I think, is going to go from sort of an offline analytics environment to essentially a real-time phenomena that will be integrated into very important uh, business processes. I want to move on a little bit and talk about the natural user interfaces. Uh, this is something that I've certainly been a big advocate for. We've been gradually moving in this direction uh, in the research domain for many years, uh, certainly at Microsoft and elsewhere. We've got well over a decade of investment in trying to emulate all the human senses, uh, hearing, vision, speech, um, et cetera. And of course, we've seen the, the world move beyond the traditional point and click, and particularly with the miniaturization and, and focus on mobility from the phones, uh, the direct manipulation of the graphical interface through touch has become very, very important as well. But so far, and I've said this many times before, each of these things was most frequently used as an alternative way to operate the graphical user interface, not as a sort of step back fundamentally and ask yourself, is there just a better way for people to interface with computers, at least for a class of problems that go beyond the ones to which we've employed them in the past. And, and we believe that this was true. And uh, 
so in the, you know, in the time since the last one of these summit meetings, for us a very profound thing happened, which was the launch of Connect. Uh, you know, Connect was the capability uh, to, to combine uh, voice in particular, but uh, machine vision, uh, very importantly, to create a, a sensor that we could fuse the inputs together in real time and create an alternative uh, way for people to interface, in this case with the Xbox game console. And, you know, it's interesting if we go back and think about this, it's, I guess, about three and a half years ago now, uh, the, the business group who builds the Xbox were looking at both the desire to change the demographics of their, um, of their customer base beyond the sort of males 12 to 30. They wanted to expand out that both in terms of gender and age. And they wanted to have a lot more ability for casual gaming. Uh, and by that we mean you know, the ability for people to get into the game quickly and enjoy it without uh, essentially the, the challenges of mastering the traditional complex game controller. The, com the, the game controller as we've known it is, in my view, much more like a musical instrument than anything else. I mean, it, you, know, you, you can become a virtuoso at playing this m instrument, but only with you know, some skills and gifts and a hell of a lot of time invested. And what we really need is a way for people to take what they already know uh, and just get in there. It's a, you know, in a sense, it's a bit more like karaoke than, than uh, you know, playing the piano. And, uh, and so Connect was a dream uh, that they had, which was controllerless gaming. You know, they'd seen the progress uh, that, for example, Nintendo had made by introducing the Wii, a motion-oriented controller, relatively simple, and a, uh, a set of, of games that were evolving around that. Uh, and, but it became clear to them that if we really wanted to have a breakthrough in this area, we, we really should connect the dots, if you will, and, and move beyond that. And the obvious place to land would be to have no controller. And after thinking about it for a while, they pretty much concluded that it didn't seem like it was really possible at that point. But uh, they came over and sat down with the MSR teams and sat, said, hey, here's, what, here's the problem we want to solve. We want to have controllerless gaming. And you know, could, you know, could we think of ways that that might happen? And so we started to look at it. And, and indeed, we found there, there were a whole array of technologies, many of them having been developed in MSR for years. None of them specifically focused at this problem of controllerless gaming, obviously. But when we brought them together, uh, what appeared to be impossible became possible. And, uh, and as soon as that happened, of course, uh, this thing became a phenomena. The, uh, the Kinect sensor got the Guinness Book of World Records uh, earlier this year for the fastest zero to eight million of anything that's ever been built and sold. And I think it showed that it sort of hit a nerve in a positive way uh, with, the, with the gaming public. Uh, and you know, they could see that, that there was real uh, value in this. For us, it was just the tip of the iceberg. But and having put it out there, it also became clear that many people immediately began to, uh, if you will, fantasize about, well, what could you do with this thing, you know, beyond what Microsoft was clearly doing with the first genre of games. And so, you know, almost immediately, uh, the device was, you know, taken off the Xbox. We intentionally had not really tried to protect it in any way. It had a standard USB plug on the end. And you saw the community develop within a week or two a uh, very primitive set of interfaces on PCs that would allow them to, to hook up the camera and begin to explore it. And so, you know, this uh, lightsaber guy is, was on YouTube, you know, pretty early on in the process. Uh, and, and, you know, he said, okay, this is what we could do. Well, it turns out there were obviously a bunch of Trekkies around Microsoft, too. And, and so they, uh, they said, well, we actually have a, a vision for this. And uh, I guess about eight weeks ago now, we actually uh, announced a product. <laughs> which uh, has the lightsabers. And uh, this thing will be part of the, the fall lineup of, uh, of the new uh, wave of games for the Kinect. And uh, so, that, you know, this is sort of the, the commercial version of what happened with the, the guy on the left. But I think it, what it showed us was that there was, in fact, a, a huge array of opportunities for the deployment of this type of technology, that putting it out on the game console was just the first step in terms of getting people to focus on it. 
you know, here's a list of things that when we looked around came from three labs on three continents, you know, from about eight or nine different groups. Uh, and it was the synthesis uh, from uh, all that research that made this thing possible. And in fact, the, almost all of those people sort of embedded themselves with the production people for almost three years because, yes, we had a research result, but then trying to meet the constraints of deploying this thing for a device that had to sell at Best Buy for $149. <laughs> that was a, essentially a, a, an additional set of challenges. And a huge amount of collaboration and refinement uh, you know, was done by the, the research community here at Microsoft, coupled to the product group, and we're extremely proud of, of that result. I mean, there are clearly a huge array of problems that have nothing to do with specifically the sensor or even the basic algorithms. Uh, trying to deal with the sensor fusion and give the right experience in, in, in you know, high ambient noise or variable light environments. Uh, one of the problems that you know, we've solved part of, but there are certainly a, a broad class of them, you know, got the, the, the name here called the annoying little brother problem. And this is the one where you know, you're standing there in front of the game and you know, playing and your little brother comes in and he stands behind you and he starts going like this too. And uh, you say, okay, you know, that cannot confuse the game. The game has to be able to distinguish you from your annoying little brother. And how does that happen? Well, it turns out it happens not because we try to you know, have the, the, the game developer uh, looking at the raw image output and trying to say, you know, okay, that thing moving, is that an arm or not? What really happened was we built a model of the human skeletal system. And you know, through a, a whole chain of processing techniques, you know, what we build and give to the developer is a fairly robust skeletal model. Uh, basically, the 42 major joints were what we mapped in that first one. We could do it for four people simultaneously at 30 hertz. We're doing this with essentially a few percentage uh, uh, points of the CPU power of the Xbox because the game gets everything else. <laughs> and so one of the challenges was how do you get this incredible amount of processing done with no specialty circuitry in the camera because that would make it too expensive. And so we have pretty much a raw data stream that goes in there and has to be processed by a tiny corner of the, of the CPU in essence. But we solved that problem and of course there are many, many more that, that ensue. You know, I showed you one of the examples of the kind of things that, uh, that people do when you, you know, let them think broadly about this, whether it's in the gaming community or something else. But one of the things that I think is very telling about the power of this natural user interaction, I'm going to uh, demonstrate with, with the next video. Um, this one it, it happened fairly recently. And it, here it's an unmodified version of the game console using essentially just some of the standard games. But there's a lot of interest in the medical community in trying to you know, use this ability for people to place themselves onto the screen or do things with other people socially uh, that's very powerful. And I was really uh, touched by this particular video and I wanted to share it with you as a way of thinking about why are we doing all this stuff and you know, what, what kind of creativity is, is out there for the application of computers in this more natural realm. So let me play this for you. Autism is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder. It affects 1 in 110 children currently in the U.S. It is manifested as a behavioral disorder, and so it has characteristics of a speech and language delay, repetitive stereotypic behaviors, and difficulty with social interaction. If you could imagine having your hands tied, having a blindfold over you, and having tape over your mouth, that's what these kids feel like. Technology is a big part of what we use and how we facilitate growth and development in the kids here at our center. So we had a connect, and what we tried to do is figure out how we can adapt our goals to fit the things that are capable of happening within the game. 
And by using that technology, we've seen a lot of changes in the kids, not only from a standpoint of communication, but social interaction, turn-taking, language development, uh, out of pretty much any kid that interacts with the system. It really has made a big difference because it's motivating and it's fun, and yet I can be working on so many of the bilateral coordination activities. I have one kiddo in particular who I've been really trying to get him to use his left side of his body and his right side of his body together. On the Connect, he's so motivated to figure out how to get this character to move that he just does it naturally. He is now coordinating both sides of his body in a way I've never seen him do outside of that gaming experience. Sam plays the Connect with his friends. They cheer each other on, they have eye contact. They're integrating with each other in ways I've never seen Sam do before. As a mom, it's incredibly exciting to have that connection with your child the eye contact, the enthusiasm. Sam's a new person now. The Connect is a revolutionary way of learning in school. Consumer technology has always brought education to life in the classroom. It's the reason why it's easy to use. Lakeside Center for Autism is raising the bar for technology-based therapy and training. And as scientists and medical researchers continue to look for a cure, it's critical that we embrace new ways to help support kids today. You know, I think that this is a great example of why we do all the things that we do. And every time I look at these kind of applications, it, it really gets me uh, charged up to go on and do more. One of the things I found really interesting was that the school came to us to tell us about this. You know, we didn't go to them. They said, hey, you know, this is just unbelievable, and, you know, you need to help us get other people to understand the power of these kind of technologies. You know, they mentioned here the, the social interaction. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, everybody talks about social networking today. But I think that this is really the beginning of, you know, a much broader form of computer-mediated interaction. Uh, that as we move from, you know, what started as the, the phone uh, and then, you know, in the passive way through television, uh, you know, we're now, and now we have sort of very weak forms of, of uh, interaction at a distance with video conferencing. But a lot of these things lack the naturalness that I think really lets people uh, just sort of suspend disbelief and get into the thing. And so we've been also thinking about how can we do more of that. So about the time we started the Connect development, you know, being sort of personally passionate about this uh, telepresence concept and the, the belief that it would be also important, uh, I started a project that was called, it's now called Avatar Connect. We uh, announced that this thing would be released in Balmer's talk at CES in January. And in fact, uh, this month, uh, in, in a few days that remain, this thing will go live worldwide. And uh, what we wanted to do was essentially go beyond just the skeletal animation uh, and create a product that would be the first step toward uh, three-dimensional uh, multi-party telepresent interaction and to use the Connect technology to do that. Uh, we started with the, the game environment, one, because that's where we had Connect. Uh, two, uh, at this stage, we have to focus on caricature type avatars because there's a real challenge in ultimately crossing what people call the uncanny valley into the place where you could have photo real avatars. And if you get stuck in the middle someplace, it's, it's kind of uh, weird and people don't like it. There's cognitive dissonance. But humans are incredibly capable of taking cues from cartoon characters. They grow up with them. Uh, they, they sense you know, very basic emotional elements from these things. And, and so it turns out that for all the reasons cartoon characters and caricatures actually are meaningful to people, so are these avatars. And they've gone from being a sort of a quirky thing in the early days of Xbox to something that's a very integral part of how people uh, interact in that environment. So there's probably, a, a, you know, 100 or 200 million avatars on Xboxes that have already been made and, of course, a fairly young uh, demographic uh, uh, for the population. And so we decided, well, if we want to experiment in this space, let's start with the Xbox community and create this product. So I'm going to play you just a, a little trailer for uh, this product that will be coming out very, very soon uh, so you get an idea if you haven't seen it before. 
bring it on. All right, guys, five minutes to kick off. Let's hear your predictions, go. Tigers by two touchdowns. No way, guys. The Ducks are gonna run all over you. In your dreams, the Ducks are going down. Hey guys, welcome back. Hey everybody. So I love tonight's episode. What did you guys think? Five stars, Heather rocks. Ditto, she's the only reason I watch the show. Too much drama, two stars. Tough crowd. Facebook mask, what do you think? Last week, the, I think we did a, a first related to this. I taped a show with Maria Bartiromo on CNBC, the Wall Street Journal report, which aired yesterday. Some of you may have seen it, where we actually did basically the same kind of thing in an interview set. And we did half the interview live face to face, and the other half the interview, we did it as avatars. Uh, and they basically you know, put it all together to try to help people understand you know, what's it going to be like to be able to have this you know, multi party interaction at a distance. But I think that was certainly the it was the first time anybody I know on national television has done an interview by an avatar. Um, but to do this, we actually had to go beyond what we did in the gaming environment. And we had to get to looking at animating your face. Because if you want to have any kind of natural interaction that's not just you know, moving around, we had to get the facial animation. And uh, you know, this is a real challenge because the resolution of these sensors, particularly in a low light environment, isn't all that good. And so you, it's much more difficult to, to just say, oh, look, you know, let's see the pixels of my eyebrow and you know, figure out where it goes. And so we developed a facial mesh model, a 3D model of that. We basically take a, you know, the points that we can reliably get out of the face. And then we know that your face can't contort arbitrarily. And so by moving these faces, we're essentially using those control points on the mesh. And then that gets mapped onto the avatar. So let me show you a little bit how this works. We use the RGB image and depth information from the Kinect sensor to capture facial movement. You can see the 3D mesh we generate from this data and watch it change as Ron moves his head and talks. We track his head as well as his mouth and eyebrow movements and render these on his Xbox avatar. So this uh, moves us to another step forward where we not only can get your, your general coarse body movement, but we can start to get your facial movements correct. And by mapping them onto the, the, the features of the, of the Xbox avatars, which we embellished uh, in the last generation to give them just enough facial elements uh, to, to convey some of the major human emotions, you can see these things. And so by the movement of the eyebrows and uh, a little bit the eyes and mostly the mouth, uh, you're, you're able to essentially correlate that with, uh, with what people are really doing in front of the sensor. And to, but to do this, you know, there were a lot of problems that had to be solved, uh, how, to how to capture the expression and, and portray it, how to handle uh, all the, the sensor data in a very low latency environment because you, you don't want that weird uh, sensation where, you know, the, where sort of the lip movement doesn't match the, the audio track. Uh, so there are a huge array of things that have gotten solved, but at least the, the V1 product is going to be out there in the next few weeks. And you know, if you're an Xbox Live Gold subscriber, you can essentially have multi-party uh, meetings with your friends anywhere in the world, up to eight people at a time uh, as, as, as your avatars. Clearly, there's a, just a ton of research problems that this begs, you know, from how do you move the avatar to be more photoreal over time. Uh, at which point you could say these meetings aren't just social and for fun anymore. You know, they are real meetings. You know, I, I believe someday we'll be able to have this meeting and you'll all just be sitting in your office and I'll look out there and I'll see all of you just like this, except none of us will really be here. It'll all be a 3D stage. And, uh, but to make that happen obviously requires uh, a lot more uh, effort in, in many dimensions. Another thing we're working on, and, and we did some work in Avatar Connect, is, is tracking the hands. In the major games, we stopped at the wrist uh, because at, at that distance, you know, the, the, there's not enough sensor resolution to do the individual digits of your hand. And, uh, but when you get a little 
up close and, and you're not moving so fast, you know, we can basically even get down to, to, the, to the hands and finger movements. And so I think all of these things will improve. Obviously, the silicon uh, environment will improve the sensor technology and, you know, we'll keep moving that along too. Uh, we think about a world where people want to not only interact with the computer this way, but where they want to be able to interact with other people. You know, I showed you the telepresence model. Uh, here I'm going to show you some different ones. So here are the cameras there, and, and when I walk in front of it, you know, the, the system should uh, start and, uh, you know, show me some people. Uh, when I walk in front, the, the system realizes that, you know, I'm here now, and it can actually uh, make these things so that they have a lot more granularity. When I just walk in the room, it might be, uh, if it doesn't know it's me or it knows I'm standing far away, you know, the interface may present things in a much coarser granularity. So here I might be a doctor and I want to confer uh, about these subjects uh, uh, or patients with uh, somebody else. So I can say I want to, you know, confer with uh, one of my colleagues. And if I can step back, now I'm using the camera more in the telepresence model uh, and I want to interact with uh, one of my colleagues. Here, you know, I, I have a, a, a gestural interface, you know, so I could essentially pick things, you know, by, by pointing at them much as I might in, in the Xbox. Uh, but here I might use the, the, the speech input. System, select the patients with BMI greater than 33. So it uh, might pick these people out. Um, one of the things that I, I'm part of with this colleague that we're discussing is essentially, let's say, a, a medical research trial for a new uh, 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 clinical trial. And so I, you know, I can say system, Select the people that qualify for the new uh, meta uh, metabolism trial. So I might pick these five. Uh, in this case, I can look at these people. I know whether I have dealt with them before. You know, we may have, have primed all of them for, uh, to be uh, considered if there were trials available. Uh, and I can say, system, enroll these people in the trial. So it might go out, collect all their data, anonymize it. Uh, send them all an email to get their actual permission. So the idea that, that more and more the workflow automation happens uh, at, uh, within the computing environment, but where you, you sort of mobilize it through these kind of interfaces, uh, I think will become more the norm uh, compared to the point and click, you know, uh, that we have in a traditional PC environment. Here I might want to uh, look at an individual patient uh, system. Show me data on Lori Penor. So Lori uh, might be a patient that we've been dealing with for a while. Uh, in this case, she's a diabetic. Uh, we've had her on a program, uh, both in terms of trying to manage her, her, uh, her diabetic condition uh, and also sort of the, the psychological issues that she's had related to that. You know, this may contain a whole lot of data that comes some from the clinical environment, some maybe from, for example, her health vault uh, service, which it might be a consumer place where her uh, you know, all of her, her data, like her polar heart monitor and other things, her scale, is, is, is creating a clinical record that's continuous as opposed to just episodic when she visits the doctors. You know, if I look at this and want to look at, that's her weight, you know, I can touch and say, show me her caloric uh, intake as we've been tracking it. Uh, and here it, it basically points out that there's something wrong or changing. Uh, you know, she sprained her ankle and reported that, you know, her activity levels have declined quite dramatically. You know, I can essentially drag them up onto the chart uh, in, and sort of look at them in a comparative way and, uh, you know, say, uh, you know, this, this is cl clearly having an effect on her, uh, her weight loss. But uh, here's an example where when we started talking, I would go out and I'd talk to people about the Avatar Connect product. And I would say, hey, you know, the dream we have is to get these avatars to be photo real. And one of the things that happened was the people in the medical community said, hey, you know, we have a lot of applications where we don't want them to be photoreal. We want them to stay caricatures because there's a lot of cases where the ability to do this anonymously uh, is really valuable. So we took some of the things that were described to us and we built a prototype here, which you could think of as Avatar Connect uh, uh, plus one at least. And I'm going to show you a, a way of thinking about how you can can use this thing uh, in a more uh, medical context. So here, we took the same basic technology of Avatar Connect. We sort of upgraded the quality of the, of the uh, avatars to be a slightly more photo real. 
Um, and what we thought about is sort of a group session here. So you've got a moderator, you've got people who are actually sitting at home, but they're having a group therapy session. But as a result, they're able to have a social interaction and maintain some anonymity. And so here, you know, the sessions can be transcribed. Even those Avatar Connect sessions, they can all be recorded. So you can record them and email them to your friends or, or you know, share them online. So here we say, well, we'll record these things. And then the doctors can essentially come back and review them. So for example, if I, if I touch on this one, you know, all of a sudden I, I can uh, you know, see this therapy session as it was recorded, even though none of them were actually there. Uh, and you know, I can you know, see how they react. Uh, there can be a moderator who's essentially coaching these people or looking at them or perhaps telling me to, you know, I should worry about you know, the way they're thinking about this. But of course, the person I cared about in this case was old Lori, not, not this guy that happened to be talking at the time. So the nice thing about these things being a 3D environment is that essentially there's no fixed viewpoint. You can essentially run the model again and look at it from any place you want. So in this case, this is old Lori, and I'm worried about her and whether she's interacting, so I could essentially you know, play it again. This and this time, even though the guy talking is over here, you know, I can decide I really want to observe her. And since you know, her basic you know, body pose and facial uh, elements are being I'm sort of sure captured in this process, even though beautiful. essentially you know, nobody else is there, you know, I might look at this and say, you know, she, she appears to be really emotionally disengaged, and uh, you know, I, I might uh, decide to refer her to one of my colleagues. So the whole idea of building these new applications where workflow and analytics you know, are all presented in this kind of environment uh, I think is the future of a lot of business process automation. And while it's easy to think about, uh, or fantasize at least, about how these things might happen in, in that kind of medical environment, I think that this will happen virtually everywhere. So you know, whether it's uh, changing the way that, that the modalities by which we interact with the computer, thinking about how big data and these cloud assets uh, are going to get coupled together, uh, or finding just completely radically new ways of thinking about what we should be doing with these computer systems. You know, all of these things are really becoming much more uh, tangible and possible today than they have been uh, certainly in, in my 40 odd years of working on this. And, uh, and so I think it's just an incredibly exciting time. And yet each step forward, you know, demonstrates that there's so much uh, yet to be done. So let me stop there and use the time we have left available for some Q&A. Thank you very much. Anybody with a question, comment? OK, right here. I think we, there's some microphones. If you just wait, we'll hand you one so everybody can hear you. I'm in a, it's on. I'm in a group that's uh, looking at medical devices, and we actually just started looking at the Connect as possibly using it to tell things like if uh, a patient was getting out of bed and doing remote sensing. I just, we, who would we talk to? Uh, are there people we could talk to at Microsoft to get more? Um, because we're just you know learning how all that works, and so well, actually, if you're pretty interested in medical applications. There might be people that want to talk to us. So one of the things that we just released was the uh, SDK for this. Uh, Microsoft Research has built a research toolkit for the Connect sensor that includes a lot of these high-level processing capabilities. When the community built their own, they really were just providing you the raw sensor data. But much of the stuff that we've learned and built uh, to give the de to the game developer, we've put into this kit, including the ability to deal with the array microphone. Uh, and so I think there's actually two sessions at this summit on, uh, on, the, on the SDK for the Kinect, uh, one on the core sensor fusion capability and the, and the kit itself, and another one, I think, on some of the application layer stuff. So I would say, first, start go to those two sessions. There'll be a little tag there you can just you know scan with your phone or your badge, uh, and, and they'll hook you up to the right people who can talk about that. Yes, sir. Can you extend your vision a little bit into smartphones and tablets and other devices that might be used in this environment? Well, uh, I guess my belief is, is that 
all of the things that I talked about here that today either have to be in a, a separate device like the Kinect sensor. Uh, there's no reason to think that these won't go through the same progression uh, that we've seen with other, other sensor technology. I mean, I could dream about a day where, you know, anywhere today that you, you have a camera, which is the back of your cell phone or the bezel of your laptop, you know, th that there's no reason to think that over time that camera shouldn't be this kind of camera. And, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of work yet to, to go to, to produce that level of miniaturization, uh, but I, I don't see any fundamental reason to think that that wouldn't happen. And therefore, many of these things, I think, will be available in the mobile environment in one form or another. One of the things that I find particularly interesting about the Avatar Connect in the mobile environment is that it's almost a zero bandwidth requirement. Because, uh, in, in fact, it takes little more than the bandwidth of the voice call itself in order to be able to animate the avatar in real time completely. Because all you're sending is the movement commands and then the avatar animates based on the computation at the other end. And so the ability to just you know, hold a phone or a tablet, stick it out there and, and essentially have a telepresent meeting even in an environment where you have very, very weak mobile connectivity bandwidth I think is an interesting future application. Number three back there. Yeah, so we've been working with the technologies behind Kinect, uh, you know, machine vision, computer vision for a long time. So I'm really excited about the computer vision aspects of Kinect. Um, but you mentioned that uh, you know the the Kinect has gone from zero to eight million of anything uh, uh, in in terms of records, and that's really fascinating. So what is your experience? Okay, can you tell us more about that information? What is the demographics? Uh, is that across countries? Is it? Uh, um, you know, yeah, I mean, the, I forget the exact number, but it, you know, yeah, basically, Connect is available everywhere that Xbox is now. Uh, so I forget the exact number of countries, but it's it's a fairly large number. Um, uh, at the launch, you know, the we we were building them as fast as we could. Uh, in fact, you know, our original guess for that first two months was, you know, our hope was well maybe we'd find five million buyers. But in fact, in the first 60 days, we had 8 million. So we had to hurry up you know, and, and really push things onto airplanes from the factories and get them distributed around the world. But we did manage to sell 8 million of them in those first 60 days. And it has had the effect of dramatically broadening the demographic. Uh, in the Connect game series, uh, there's probably uh, at, at least as many uh, girls and women who are playing these games as there are uh, males. And of course, that was never true in the traditional Xbox environment. <coughs> it's also true that the gen not only is the gender mix more balanced, but the age group changed dramatically. There's a, a, a number of things you can do with the Avatar Connect. One of them is that it has a, an Avatar, uh, I mean, a, a, a Connect video conference facility. And what's interesting about it is that while it's just you know more traditional video conferencing. The camera uh, tracks you as you move around, even and you're you know so you're now you're sitting some uh, significant distance away from the screen. So many of the problems that you have <coughs> with traditional sort of PC-based uh, video conferencing, where when you're so close, the the di you know the angular displacement of the camera, you know from where your gaze is, gives you that very weird sensation. When you're far back, that angle becomes just a couple degrees, and the gaze problem is sort of automatically corrected. In addition, we use the beam forming on the array microphone so that even though you're sitting maybe 10 feet away, you, you, the signal to noise ratio is dramatically improved. And in fact, one of the things uh, that's happening now is we're starting to fuse the sensors together. So uh, in the newest version of the software we're doing, we use the machine vision to figure out where your head is. And then we actually aim the, the, the uh, we track your head with the beam of the array microphone. And so even before you start to talk, the thing knows where you are and is only listening to your mouth. So even though if you've got the vacuum cleaner, you know, or other things running in the house, even though those would be loud, the, the beam basically focuses only on you. And so there's a lot of very interesting things happening. But it has had the effect of broadening the, the demographic both in age and gender. Lady right over here. Have you? It's on. 
Have you thought of extending um, the avatars to the SDK itself? So instead of just coding by typing, you code or you build models through with your avatar? Uh, it's not something I've thought about, but you're welcome to try this afternoon. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we actually have done a lot of work at, in various parts of MSR thinking about sort of synthesizing programs, you know, from other than traditional means of, you know, enter the code and see what, ha you know, compile it and get a program. Uh, so we're quite interested in that, although I, I haven't myself seen or, but you can ask Rick, he may know, uh, if, if there's anybody who's thinking about how the avatar might play a role in code production. When I did this interview with Maria Bartiromo at the end, she said, this is pretty good. Maybe I won't have to come to work in the future. I'll just <laughs> sit here. So, I mean, maybe you can just send your avatar to type on the keyboard for you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, in the back there, last question. Have you ever thought of a world where we don't have to get out of the house and just be inside and play out in the courtyard without having to physically be there? Would that be not fun? <laughs> I guess it depends on your advantage point, but you know, uh, the, uh, you know, one of the things that people actually, at least parents, like about Connect is that the kids actually get up and move. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's been a lot of concern that, you know, are you, one, isolated, and two, sedentary you know, as you play these games. And so the fact is, in the Connect environment, another thing that we've observed is that even within the room you're in, it's a far more social environment. Instead of you know, sitting there and watching somebody you know, move the joystick and, and see what happens on the screen, you know, there's never much social about that. So you can have multi-party games, you know, but, but the local socialization component was pretty low. In the Connect environment, it's very high. People get a real charge out of watching the people participate and being able to sort of watch simultaneously you know, their, their physical actions and their actions in the game and that of other people. And so I think that, you know, the, the ability uh, the, or the, the necessity to move is, in like many, viewed as, a, as an advantage. So I don't know whether getting, a, getting away from actually having to go outside will be viewed by everybody as a good thing, but certainly you can, uh, you can experiment with that too. Well, thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoy the conference, and thanks for coming and visiting us. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks. Great talk. It was great.